you. Thank you for all your attention. Uh, now we come to a little bit about solid science piece and narrow down from the US and the world to New England to Massachusetts. And this is just one of the first pieces we're going to cover in the, in the next few uh, talks. And for me, I'm focusing on the greenhouse gases, particularly related to the carbon dioxide and methane, and how it is, the flux is affected by so much restoration in the Massachusetts area. And first, acknowledge that the funding source mainly from the BWM1 and BWM2. Now we just end in there. We have collaboration, a lot of collaborators, and the team workers, team peop, uh, the people here, you will see more. I'm not uh, trying to repeat. This is a very important slide I want to show you. For us, we try to understand the picture of the carbon. In order to do that, we have to understand a little bit more detail of the carbon components. For us, we narrow down to basically four pieces. And the number one, we have to understand the vertical carbon fluxes. And we know that the carbon is dynamic change in the ecosystems. We have to understand what we call a net ecosystem carbon exchange or net carbon productivity, NEP, which is a net result of carbon in and out. And, but we, in order to do modeling, in order to understand mechanism, we have to understand more of the pieces, which is R, we call the ecosystem respiration, which is carbon emission from the ecosystem uh, induced by the like, plant respiration and soil microbial respiration, decomposition of the organic carbon in, in, uh, in the sediment, in the soil. And also we have a big called the input of the carbon, which is primary carbon input called the GPP, gross primary production, which is some of the photosynthesis. Basically, photosynthesis here is taking up carbon from the atmosphere into the system. So any system, any blue carbon we're talking about is driven by photosynthesis. However, not all the carbon fixed by photosynthesis is being, can be stored or can be used. A lot of things immediate back, as I said, as a, as a respiration. And of course, we have methane. A lot of carbon in the soil in the sediment is released not as a form of CO2, but as a form of methane, which is even more potent uh, greenhouse gas, uh, gases. So that we have to understand methane. As Ariana said, uh, yes, methane is something full of uncertainty. And also a lot of got the lateral flux there, basically carbon in and out through the water, through flooding, because the coastal system. So carbon can be, related, can be uh, lost through those uh, lateral exchange. So we have to understand all the components. To, 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 to understand the, the components, we, then we can assess or we can evaluate the change of the system. We call it the, from baseline to the restored or conservation. So that if we restore or conserve the system or change the system, so all the components could be changed. Not only the net carbon barrier or net carbon productivity or barrier in the soil, but also all the components. So our goal, one of the major goals, is to restore the system so that the carbon input could be either uh, equivalent or increased, and the release of carbon decomposition could be uh, reduced, and the methane, particularly methane, could be dramatically reduced. If we, if, if we go toward that goal, then the total carbon input or carbon stock or barrier rate could be increased. So that if we can increase the input and reduce the output, so that the carbon can be stored in the system. So that's the goal. That's why we have to understand a little bit the detail of the in, in and out of the system. So for the Hen River, it's, it's a case study for our uh, project. We want to understand the change or the, the, the future change of the carbon after the system is restored. Currently, it's not yet. So we have a dike here. It's uh, the imported the dike so that the inland of the Hen River, the yellow is become very degraded, become uh, brackish, and the fresh water. So after the restoration means after we break the dike, so the seawater come in the system, so that in the whole entire area can be uh, become the salt marsh, so that uh, it, it flooded the salt marsh, tidally flooded salt marsh. So our goal is to understand, for science point to understand, okay, uh, downstream of the dike, and also other uh, area of the nat natural marsh. So what's the difference of the greenhouse gases in the natural marsh versus those degraded system? So that the, <coughs> the current discrete is a kind of baseline. So after we break the dike and let's see what in, then we have a real salt marsh built up or restored. So that we want to compare what's, what's happening after those systems have been restored. 
so that we can compare or compare the difference of the natural salt marsh versus the baseline system so that we can get the carbon credit. So here the current system looks like there's the many, uh, there's the dikes here. So after it's, uh, it's, uh, it's being diked for about 100 years, the, the upland system become very complicated. A lot of fresh water, cactus system, wet, wet forest and wet dry forest, and we have some phragmite and we have some wet shrub. So all the system, we go to the field. My group go to the field, went to the field, and make a measurement. Like for example, uh, this phragmite site looks like this, and then we uh, go to the dry forest, and we make a gas, a greenhouse gas measurement, and we went to the shrub, wet shrub, and we went to the phragmite cattail, which is typhoon, and we also uh, went to the wet forest, and we measured greenhouse gas in all the system and we try to compare those systems with the natural uh, salt marsh. And also we try to understand a little bit more of the newly restored versus natural system. So when the, uh, uh, when the Han River is restored, it becomes newly restored. It's not directly go to natural salt marsh. So we want to also go to a current in a newly restored system. We made their uh, greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We try to compare the newly restored versus naturally restored eventually understand the transition from the degraded system to the newly restored and all the way to kind of long-term st uh, steady state uh, system. So we have a three period time, but we can also wait. We to, that's why we go as kind of coronary sequence approach, basically go to the current existing system, use that as an as a example to show what uh, would happen in Heron River. So we went to the four uh, 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 restore the system, currently restored, out of the uh, Hidden River in Cape Cod. And we also measure, we measure, we went to measure the one is behind the dike with newly restored, and then uh, after uh, the, the uh, downstream of the dike, which is a uh, natural system. So we compare the newly restored with the natural system, trying to understand what happened after it is restored, after those uh, small kind of watershed is, uh, was restored. So we make a lot of uh, field measurement. And for the uh, technology, so we kind of ensemble, we put together, uh, uh, at that time we call the newly very uh, cool system that we can allow, we allow us to instantaneously measure the greenhouse gas uh, fluxes. Before our project started, people, most of the people will have to take a gas, uh, gas cylinder sample back to lab. Now we assemble that technology, allow us to Im uh, instantaneously measure gas flux in the system. And we also designed, my group designed different kind of chamber. We, go to, we went to the field and put chamber in the marsh system, and we run the gas, uh, basically gas in and out, basically gas circling around the chamber, inside chamber, and to the analyzer, so that the analyzer can give us a reading of the concentration increase after the chamber is covered in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the salt marsh. And then we can calculate the gas flux from that small area. And that uh, system is gradually involved to the even smaller one. This one is more portable to do the measurement. And uh, again, the vegetation change. That is the previous I showed in the saw marsh, and we have different systems. Like we have a, a cactail, which is a little bit taller, much taller than the Spartina saw marsh, and we have a very tall phragmite. So we have to design all those different chambers. We cover the system from the relatively small one to the tall and to a very tall one. Actually, this is, we need a three section of the chamber connect together. We need a ladder to climb up to hold the system so that we can measure the gas flux from those phragmite uh, plants. So that, that uh, takes a little bit of uh, work and more complicated. And more than that, we, as I said, we not only try to understand the, 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 the gas, net gas flux, but also want to understand the photosynthesis and respiration as two different components. So we uh, use the called the transparent chamber that allowed us go to measure the net carbon exchange, and we're also using uh, just a covered. Basically, after the system is covered, after the chamber covered, then the photosynthesis lost. There's no photosynthesis because there's no light, and then the system becomes the pure respiration. So we also measure the respiration, pure respiration, and then we compare with the net carbon versus pure respiration uh, emissions then we can get the GPP as a, as, a, as a difference between these two components. So that we get the growth primary production as a photosynthesis. 
we also try to understand the gross emission of the respiration, which is coming out. And recently, since last year, actually, we, we put some even newer technology. We put uh, the eddy called eddy covariance system, which is carbon dioxide and methane simultaneously. Or, or automatically, we can measure those systems. Not, we don't need to go to the field. Then we put a system there, automatically get the data. The data is there. We have the process, but we now get some continuous data, which is fixed into that uh, uh, much. And also, we have another system in uh, Fragmatic. Basically, fixed that system can directly measure. And we also put uh, some newer called the fluorescent system that allow us to measure photosynthesis. That's all the newer system. So you can see our project actually technology and method is also evolving over time. So here's some of the result. Uh, it's not looks very cool, but it's really help us to really understand the system. So here's some of the, uh, this is natural salt marsh, and this is fragmenty, and this cactus typhus. And we measure the, we calculate the GPP, which we use a negative sign to show in the GPP or the photosynthesis uptake of the system, we use negative. So more negative means more uptake of the carbon by the, uh, by the marshes. So then we, we measure, okay, this so much looks like this. And X axis indicated the year, uh, the season, season of the year. So this is uh, like summertime, there's more uptake. And this is spring and this is fall. And the fragmite is also like this, and this is a cocktail. So what we can see from those, not many data, but we're showing that the fragmite really can take up more carbon dioxide. So there's more ability for fragmite to absorb the carbon and, and put it into system than the salt marsh and typhoon. However, on the other hand, for respiration, the carbon emission, fragmite also have a higher ability to emit the carbon compared with the salt marsh and the cocktail. So overall, we see the seasonal pattern, like increasing from the spring to the summer and then go down to the fall. But overall, we can see the trend. The trend is the fragmite have the more carbon uptake and also, meanwhile, has a higher carbon release rate. So overall, we can calculate the, uh, the uh, we can get the net efficient carbon productivity. This is, again, the salt marsh, fragmite, and cocktail over the season, over the, over the season of the year, over the month. And we can see some of the curve, show you fragmite and this cocktail. Another piece is, is methane, as I said. Methane is very difficult to measure because you know, it's, it's bubbly. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very sensitive to disturbance, to other drivers. And we measure the uh, salt marsh and fragmite and cocktail. And overall, if we put the same scale, fragmite, has dramatic a higher rate of emission of methane compared with uh, ma uh, and, uh, spartina marsh and a cacti. If we put the same scale, it's almost zero, but we can only see the fragmite. If we uh, downscale a little bit, just look at marsh and a cacti, then we, we do see, we did find the methane emission from marshes and cacti. They are similar, but the cacti has a little bit more higher rate of the methane emissions, while the marshes Spartana salt marsh has the very lowest, lowest rate of the methane emissions. And we also uh, look at, as I said, we have to understand a little bit more of a natural versus newly restored. Because once the uh, Heron River is restored, it's still new, new system. It's not uh, natural until like 20, maybe 50 years later. So we compare the four system, uh, four sites of the newly restored and the natural marsh. And overall, the red indicated the the uh, uh, newly restored and the blue line indicated the, uh, the natural marsh. And when we overall, that, that is the NEP, which is net carbon exchange, which is net carbon uh, uptake. And then this is a, a season again, over the season. So we found that within all the four system, this is two year of data, and overall the red line, which is uh, restored marsh, has lower rate. Uh, negative, more negative, which means a higher rate of carbon uptake. So the restored marsh can take up more carbon compared with the natural marsh overall. So we can do the uh, average calculation, and we found overall, see, the red line is lower than the blue line, which is a higher negative, which means more uptake of the carbon compared with the natural system. So we kind of preliminarily we put together, uh, simply do some calculate. Afternoon, you'll see a sufficient model. You'll see how the model handle those things. But now I put together, overall, 
the average mean value of the carbon dioxide and methane across the four, we put the four sites over there. One is natural marsh, and this is a restored, newly restored marsh, and this is Phragmite, and this is Cactail. So overall, we can see carbon uptake in Phragmite has a very highest rate, about between 600 and 700 uh, gram of carbon per square meter per year. So now I'm sum up uh, over the year. So this is per year. So per year, Phragmite has higher carbon uptake and uh, uh, higher than the cactail and followed by restore marsh and the natural marsh. Again, this is just the carbon, this is net carbon uptake. It doesn't mean it's equivalent to the carbon storage or barrier rate. Later on, you'll see the carbon barrier rate, which is finally stored there. So this is the carbon uptake, the gas from the atmosphere to the store system. And there may be a lot of carbon loss you know, through, the, through the flooding, from the tidal flooding. The carbon could be laterally lost through the system. So that final rate will be a little different. So we'll see that later on, the final barrier rate. But here is carbon uptake. And for methane, there's no any story. Methane is lost, it's lost as greenhouse gas. So the, for methane, the fragmentity has much higher rate compared with the cactail and so much nearly restored and the, uh, the current natural so much. So the fragmentity again has a very high rate of the methane emissions. So here, now we put together, I, I can have some of the conclusion. So fragmentity, spatina, so much, and a typhoon, cactail, they all significant carbon sink. There's no doubt for carbon polymer, they take up carbon, they store the system. Some of them could be lost, but a lot of carbon still stay in the, in, in the marshes. So they are very good in taking up carbon. They are more powerful than the terrestrial system, as people review. I think there's no doubt, as our data show that. And for invaded fragmented brackish, which is brackish, they emitted much higher the methane emissions than the native, the typhoon marsh, and they, because of methane, if we can compute the methane to the carbon equivalent or CO2 equivalent, we can find that the, the, the fragmented site could be switched from the carbon sink to carbon source, even though there's a lot of carbon uptake, CO2 uptake, because the emission of the methane, they can switch from the pure carbon so uh, sink to the source because of the methane. And uh, for carbon uptake, rates in the newly restored site were higher than natural site. So again, if we look at the long term, the newly restored site usually have a higher rate of carbon storage and carbon uptake because the degraded system lost a lot of carbon. So initially, the, the, the elevation is also low and the flooding frequency will be also higher so that the newly restored site could initially have a higher ability to store the carbon, take out carbon, put the system, and gradually go to the kind of steady state of the natural system. So that if we have a curve, I have a drop curve. So initially, the carbon rate is very low, degree system, and then go up if it's, uh, if it's nearly restored, after restored, and then gradually go to some equi equilibrium as toward uh, the natural system. So the system is dynamic. It's not a linear. It's not a, just a, a one point of view. It's different phase of the restoration if we want to do that. So finally, restoration of the degree wash to some uh, uh, degraded wetland to so much, we have significant carbon benefit. From our data point of view, there's carbon benefit there. And uh, you'll see that how we do feasibility study based on all those data set to understand or to quantify those carbon benefit to go toward the carbon credit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, Let's take one or two questions for Jim, really quickly. Any questions at the back? Just wait for the microphone, and when you do get it, would you please introduce yourself and then ask your question? Thank you. Actually, the, the both are higher. So we found that both, restora uh, both respiration and photosynthesis are higher, but the, the photosynthesis is even higher, and so the net result is higher. So we don't know exact reason, but I think more or less related to the first uh, higher biomass, the growth rate itself is higher, and also the, uh, the elevation is lower, so then more flooding and more kind of lower uh, decomposition rate of the restored uh, system. 
that is based on our foresight in Cape Cod. We found that uh, that uh, that's kind of trend of the, all the newly restored system. Behind you, Slory. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we we do have some data showing that pure microbial respiration. For example, now what we see the chamber, basically the chamber, dark chamber, we cover the both plant and uh, microbial respiration, both. But we do have, I don't, not show you here because time limited, we have a small chamber which we can cover pure the soil and sediment itself without any plant so that those decomposition rate can be measured. So we do measure called soil respiration without plants so that those are microbial activities. Yeah, we can uh, quantify the microbial activities through the measurement of the carbon fluxes. Okay, great. So Ariana, only because you're special and you, you you made the trip. So we'll take one more question. My mic is right here. Great. So I'm curious about the greater flux in the frag community. Do, did you guys get a chance to ask whether that's driven mostly by the increased carbon input or a change in the microbial community or both or some kind of combination there? Yeah, I think uh, it's a kind of combination. I think the, for Phragmite, uh the higher carbon uptake rate is a result of the higher photosynthesis and the respiration, both. They just grow faster. Right and the plant biomass is also higher. And as for methane, that's another story. The methane flux is higher, that's complicated. We still don't quite know. I think more or less related to the conductivity of the methane plant itself, uh, no, the phragmatic plant itself, they basically have a higher conductivity for the methane from the soil all the way to the uh, atmosphere. The other is the root itself, the, the, the rhizo system of the uh, phragmatic cause some of the higher productivity of the methane over there. So it, it's not just salinity itself, because we also compare with Typha, which have a similar salinity level, but it's a different density and different structure of the plants called different methane emissions. Mm 